All right, folks, grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and let your friends know to meet you at the club. Welcome to Behind the Scenes with the Unlocking the Club podcast. We're just about to get started right now. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to Behind the Scenes with the Unlocking the Club podcast. My name is Angela Taylor, and I will be your host. Really appreciate you all joining us for today's conversation. In addition to having a really candid conversation with an amazing slate of guests, starting today with Mia Jackson, one of the things that I want you to know is as I work to grow this podcast, I'm actually motivated to share various aspects of actually building a podcast and a podcast community. So that may include things from sponsorship to logistics to messaging and more. And that's what we're gonna do in the behind the scenes episodes. This is important to me for a variety of reasons, but mainly because one of the ways in which I've evolved over the years, particularly as an entrepreneur, but certainly as a person, is actually knowing when to ask for help. I was literally having this conversation earlier today with somebody in my first evolution as an entrepreneur, I wouldn't ask for help. I was trying to figure things out on my own. And that word was not in my vocabulary. But I'm a much better entrepreneur the second time around. Not because I know more, but because I'm simply willing to ask for help. Early on in the journey, I was determined to figure things out on my own and maybe prove to myself that I was capable, prove to others that I was worthy. I don't know what it was. I'm actually gonna talk to our guest today about that sense of, of not feeling like you can ask for help. Um, because it may take away and deter from who you think you are or should be in others' eyes. But I'm actually comfortable now in asking for help, and I want to share all of my learnings with others so that you don't actually have to experience some of the same obstacles or failures that I have. And that possibly you can get the insight you need before you actually need it or have a use for it. So that's what the behind the scenes show is about. It's providing a little bit of visibility and access to you through my learning journey. And the insight I have for you today is literally about trusting yourself because success is not only found in the outcomes, but success can be found throughout the journey. You have to embrace each and every moment. You have to learn from each moment. So welcome to the behind the scenes with Unlocking the Club podcast where I'll peel back the curtains for you and invite you in on the journey. I'll dig a little bit further into this topic momentarily with our next guest, who I can't wait for you to hear from. On today's episode of Behind the Scenes with the Unlocking the Club podcast, we'll be joined by Mia Jackson. Mia is owner and founder of Doro Marketing Services. Doro has been featured in national media, including USA Today, MSNBC Nightly News with Brian Williams, and Black Enterprise. Through her consulting work with Doro, Mia focuses on building brands that are committed to mindful missions. She's a seasoned communicator and relationship builder with a passion for baking, sports, and building community. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Let's get ready to go behind the scenes with Mia Jackson. Mia, welcome to Unlocking the Club and our behind the scenes. How are you doing, Mm -hmm. my sister? I'm doing well, doing well. Happy to be here with you. Always happy to be with you. Yeah, well, thank you for for, for jumping on. Like, I know we saw each other recently for mm-hmm. the first time. It's been a long couple of years where we all haven't been able to get together. Um, but it was, I still right now am, am high on yes. just the energy from being in the same space for so many people. How was it for you? Yeah, I'm still basking in the glow as well. It was amazing just to see people that I hadn't seen, some in a few years like you, others in decades. And that was wonderful to be able to go back and experience and learn together, grow together, and then just sit and laugh and eat and relax and just be, just be. So it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a variety of reasons why I'm excited to to be in conversation with with me today. And and we'll reveal a little bit of a surprise a little bit later on. Um, But she's something I I actually have a deep respect and appreciation of. Not just because I'm excited to announce that she's going to be joining me from time to time as a co-host on Unlocking the Club. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But we're actually going to take our offline conversations that we have on a regular basis, whether it's through chats um, or when we actually catch each other on the phone. 
where we discuss and debate everything from sports, our, our common love, to politics. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we want to share them with the world. So we actually had done this before, Mia, on this podcast called Game Changers Live. Like, do you remember Game Changers Live? And what is it that that still resonates with you from that experience that we had? Oh, gosh, yes. I, I had such a good time with you all. I think as you were alluding to in your intro, there were a lot of things we didn't know when we did Game Changers Live. Some we did, but also we were all really busy at different points in our lives trying to do it in the midst of doing a lot of other things. But even with that, I think that the camaraderie we had, the synergy that you and Bev and I had, uh, we didn't always agree on everything. Sorry, Bev, I still like Kobe. Um, <laughs> You know, and we we just were still able to have the discussions, bring in really key, credible people in the sports and entertainment world. And I think we still shared a lot. People still actually ask me about certain things about the podcast because it was really good, even though we didn't know what we were doing. Absolutely. And it was one of those things that we had some amazing guests, right? Mm -hmm. Condoleezza Rice, James Brown, Bamani Jones, the list goes on and on. Um, and it was the conversations that we actually had, um, the learnings and the insight and the fact that we didn't all have to be on the same page, right? Um, but we had a perspective that we were gonna share and we were gonna learn with and from each other. Yes, and we respected each other's opinions regardless. Yeah, yeah. That was the thing, we could have those discussions, get a little heated sometimes, but never ever boarded on being disrespectful to, to each other or any of the guests. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, and I mentioned it in the opening, was um, I was recently speaking to some graduating seniors, and I talked to them about success and what that looks like. And so often we see somebody, and in our eyes, like they have all of the characteristics of what we think and how we define success to be. Um, but in my older age, uh, I'm starting to learn that success isn't just about the outcomes. Success is actually happens along the way and throughout the journey. And mm -hmm. if you actually are able to pause and take a moment to assess the situation and and understand what's happening around you, like right then in those moments, you'll be able to enjoy them in a much different way than you do otherwise. What does success mean to you? How are you defining it? Is it the same way now as when you graduated from Stanford? Oh, gosh, no. When I graduated from Stanford, you know, you have that list of things that you're supposed to do and those marks that you're supposed to make. And you're looking at all of the external factors, right? Yeah. Because that's what you've been told. Now you go out there and you take on the world. Well, you go through enough and you make enough mistakes and you go through enough through through so many changes that you finally realize if you take that time and pay attention, you realize that, wow, I am growing as a person each time one of those things happen. I've learned something new that not only can make my life better and successful, um, but also I can help someone else along the way. And the, uh, the thing I think if I had to define success, um, I, I'd go back to the Maya Angelou quote, and I can't use this, I can't remember it exactly, but she said, basically, it's liking who you are and what you're doing and where you are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it that you have to be at peace success for me is peace now there are other external factors yeah that we want to get you want to have security but money you know all of those things a little bit of notoriety here and there but for the most part if you have those things and you are in a peace it doesn't matter yeah yeah so peace for me mm -hmm. well i love so much of what you just said resonated with me mm -hmm. um and that, that my angelic quote like like you have to like who you are I think that so often early on in my journey, um, and, and I sense for other Black women that I talk to, particularly who are early on in their journey, so much of who we believe ourselves to be is defined externally, right? By, by media messaging, um, by you know the opportunities we do get or we don't get inside of corporate structures. Um, or, you know, what social media now is much different than it was when, when we were coming out of college. Um, so how do you define yourself now? Oh, gosh. It's, it is things have changed so much. I remember working in corporate America when everyone was just dealing with banner ads, right? And, you're, and you have, we're figuring out how to present ourselves online. 
And now you look at it and you realize the person who people see online is very seldom the person that you know. Uh, there, are very, there are few people out there who show themselves authentically, but even if they do, they're just pieces that you can't see just because of just by default, you can't have a camera on 24 seven. But I think I see myself now as, you know, I'm still a mom. That's always first. Uh, and still someone who wants to make a mark on the world. I think I still see myself as someone who has a lot to offer in several different ways, it, be it work or just relationships and connections that I build for other people. I see myself as a connector, uh, primarily. Yeah, yeah. Well, you talked about that, that career in corporate America, right? So you started at, at Charles Schwab, yes. right? and then you also spent some time with the nonprofits, mm -hmm. um, and then went into entrepreneurship. And it feels like, if I, if I remember correctly, like the majority of your journey has been as an entrepreneur um, and my sense of it, if it, if it parallels with, with my journey, is that um, corporate America, I thought was for me, and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. right? um, and it was this club that I thought I wanted to get into, but the rules weren't um, available to me, right? Um, I didn't have access, and I was fighting against the system and the structure, um, and it was just completely debilitating. Yes. And... I, I wanted to go out and do things on my own. Like what was the corporate journey for you? Like what were the clubs that you thought you wanted to belong to? And was it really that you wanted to belong to them or, or was it what you thought you wanted? Uh, partially, I think it's what I thought I wanted. Some of it I wanted for sure, just because that's what we grew up seeing. Yeah. And we were coming out of the eighties where everything was, you know, I, I remember the movie with Tom Cruise and the phone, right. You know, so you, <laughs> so you, that's what, success looked like, right? You were this big mogul somewhere. Um, and I landed at Charles Schwab, which was great because it was a good group of people inside the company. And Mr. Schwab was very welcoming to me. I met him through my old boss, who was Dr. Rice. So that was also a very different way of coming into a company when you meet with the founder first, you know, but um, again, still, I still, to this day, count among some of my closest friends, people that I met there. Uh, but the work itself, I don't know if I actually fit. Mm -hmm. you know, I could do the work, I could do good work, but I don't know if I was allowed to necessarily, or people could read me or read even some of the things. Why are you so angry? You know, every black woman gets that one, right? At some point you say okay. something you don't like, and you know, it's like, oh my God, you're aggressive. Okay. So I don't know if, even though I had the right, a, a great entry into the corporate world, if the structure itself was ready to embrace me. Mm. I did get to work on some specific projects about African-Americans and investing, which I loved okay. because in those, I was able to connect with other people, but most of them were again, outside the corporation. So even inside the corporation, there was a commitment to it from the upper levels. But I think the people who you work with day to day may not be seized at that point in particular. Nobody was talking about DNI the way they're talking about it today. Right. So, um, so it was definitely a different experience. And and I think for me, once I left it, I remember the day because they they actually had layoffs and they were laying off a whole lot of folk, and I was one of them. And I remember the day walking down Third Street in San Francisco and feeling free. Mm. It was crazy because I thought I should be crying. I should be worried. I should be upset. I don't think I've ever felt that free in my whole entire life. I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I was excited. And uh, and that also the the unexpected reaction for me told me something. Yeah. It's like, you know what? You weren't where you wanted to be. Yeah. yeah. And you did, and you just kept putting that feeling aside, pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down, because you thought this is what I must do. Yeah. And so once I realized, well, no, you have the option to try to do something else. Then, or now this is your time. If you're gonna do it, do it. Yes. Yes. Well, that word, I felt free. Mm -hmm. I have to pause for a moment and just let that settle in. What? actually did that mean? What was that feeling like? 
I don't I don't even know if I can put it into words. It was literally I felt like I could breathe in and breathe out completely. Yeah. I didn't have to. There was no censoring my myself just literally even walking down the street. I wasn't in anticipation of anything or what I should be doing or how I should be. There was no should at that moment. It was what do you want to do? Who do you want to be? Yeah. And it was very, I I can really put myself back in that feeling when I think about it still to this day, because it was so amazing. Yeah. Well, and I think for me in that journey, there was a compartmentalization that happened on a daily basis, you know, at least Monday through Friday is, you know, as soon as you get on that elevator and heading up to your floor, right, you had to put on a different face and who you were, right? Um, and then when you left and you got home, it could be a completely different you that connected with your friends and the family and the friends group that you wanted to be amongst and with. And that compartmentalization made a lot of sense for me early on. I was actually, I took pride in being able to separate work from home, but then it became exhausting. Right. And so when you say free, like it literally like where you were able to release this burden that you had had of being in a space where you had to be something other than who you were fully and authentically. And I want to say something when we talk about separating work from home, I, I think that's what we called it, but that's not what it was because we still have to, even if you're an entrepreneur, you still have to separate your home life and yourself, uh, you know, or what you do on a daily basis, daily basis uh, from work. But it was more separating work yourself from work. Yeah. And I, because, you know, you had to literally not be you in a lot of places. And that from talking about the music you liked or, you know, who knows what you ate for dinner. I don't know. It was just very different that all of the things we felt we had to censor. So it wasn't just separating the work home, work life, work family balance. It was really separating that, you know, the, those two things, but also the, the authentic internal self that you didn't get to show. Right, right. Well, and I want to go back and probe on something that you mentioned. Um, certainly you were introduced to Mr. Schwab by uh, a mentor, a colleague of yours, and Dr. Rice. Um, and that's the holy grail, right? What, well, as, as Black women and those that have been historically excluded or marginalized, we, again, I talk about this all the time, we, are, we learn early on that you have to put your head down and work hard and hopefully, like, right, you'll get the results that you want. It's a meritocracy. And we hear this thing about, you know, it's who you know, and you're like, okay, no, it's going to be who I am and what I'm mm -hmm. able to deliver. And it does quickly become very familiar that it is who you know. Well, you knew the the the, the dude had had his name on right the logo. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a sense at that time in your journey of how to leverage that relationship? You had the relationship, and you're such a relationship builder. Did you know how to leverage it, and did you have a, a desire too? I really didn't know how to leverage the all the relationships that I had at my fingertips, especially then. Uh, quite a few. And if I, if the me today had those relationships at 30, oh my Jesus, things would be so different because I really did not know. They were just people that I met who were good people who liked me and I liked them. Yeah. 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 And that's the way it worked. And I even down to his assistant who I thought about recently, Kay Kaplan, who I love Kay to death. And I said, recently, I said, I got to reach out to Kay and say hi, because we haven't spoken in a minute, but she would call and check on me. Hey, how you doing down there? You know, because we just built that relationship really quickly. <laughs> she liked me for some reason. But um, I realize now that people would probably, with the access that people pay for, exactly. I had it at my fingertips. Yeah. And in a lot of different circumstances and rooms that I've been in, pictures I have, and I look back sometimes even now, I've been unpacking recently because I switched uh, moving. Uh, I moved to a different space and I've been looking at some of the pictures going, what was I doing? What didn't I do with these relationships? Jesus Christ. And maybe it just wasn't time. Maybe sure. I needed to grow to it because some of them I still have access to, but it's still very different. 
you know, the, your thirties and your fifties are very different. They are, they are. And one of the things that I wanted for this audience is, does it have to be? Because I think so often in that journey, when you, when you hit those roadblocks, you look inside and you're like, what am I not doing? Let me work harder. Let me get smarter. Let me consume more information and learn more. And the truth of the matter is social capital is the key is mm -hmm. the passcode in corporate America. Yes. And I'm wondering if I know for me, I didn't want to leverage relationships I had because it didn't look right. Right. Um, it, it felt like it wasn't how you earn your way. And that was, again, how I was taught and what I learned, but was that the passcode to getting by and through in corporate America? Mm -hmm. I think uh, two things that you hit on there, basically. One is, do they have to be different, right? I have a 92-year-old a great aunt. I called her on her birthday and she said, girl, I'm just 29 backwards. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I said, okay, I think I'm going to use that idea, right? You just have to do the thing regardless of what your age is. She said, I still, I feel like I do pretty good. That's what she said to me. So I said, okay, this age really is a number, as they said. Um, and then you were talking about the social capital, the way we were raised, you don't use people in our community. That's the one thing you didn't do. You were supposed to keep those relationships holy if you would, uh, and separate. And a friend was just a friend and you didn't use them like yeah. that. That was not part of, we weren't raised in that game. Yeah. And so, especially if you were raised in a Baptist community, oh no, you don't do that. Sure. Right. And uh, I, you realize much later, oh wow, I was sitting on a whole lot right now, a whole lot of power that I didn't realize I was sitting on. Exactly. And so those were two things. And the other is once you make those mistakes, and even at this age, I, uh, when you were talking earlier about the seniors that you spoke to, I have a group of nieces and nephews and friends, kids, some of them and friends, kids. And every Monday, uh, I try to do it every single Monday during the school year. I send them a message and I call it TT's Monday message. And I text them. And this past Monday, it was like, you can always begin. You can be a beginner every day. Mm. So, you know, because some of them are getting ready to graduate high school, they're starting over and I'm like, you know, it won't end. This won't be the last time you start, you get to begin again. I love and that. I think that's something we have to remind ourselves. It is. You can begin every day. It's so true. And it's a reframing mm -hmm. right? the conversation. Like even in the essence of, I don't want to use anybody. I don't want to use people. Um, well, it's true the matter is in the core of America, they're using folks and exploiting others in, in, in many different ways. Um, and there's there's a happy medium where there's reciprocity in the situation, right? But it's the mindset and it's a shift from being like, it's a meritocracy, so I'm gonna earn my way to, like, it's all about relationships. Like I need to have those relationships with influencers to be able to pull me through. I yes. can't do it alone as currently constructed in corporate America. Mm -hmm. And it's an and, it's a both and. Yeah. Yes. You still need to be able to do what you do yeah. and know what you know. But if you have those things, that's not going to guarantee you that next rung on the ladder. You have to have the relationships and you have to know how to say it and, and make it easy. I always say when you knew when you're good at what you do, it just makes it easy for those people to help you. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's indeed. Well, I, I think you're someone that is constantly helping others. Um, and and you are someone that when folks are trying to figure out how to get to from A to Z, they reach out to. So what is it inside of being that person that everyone is gonna call that feeds your soul? That's an interesting one because I've been sort of grappling with that recently. Like, okay, you know you're gonna get the calls and sometimes you have to turn off the phone. <laughs> uh, but I think it really helps me. I feel really good when I know that there is passing on that information, even about the social capital yeah. to let's say it's a, a young girl. This just this past week, she's a screenwriting student. She wants to get into the industry. And I was like, all right, we got to make some phone calls. Let's get this. But in order to do that, you call me first. And then we have this conversation and it's just great to hear her get excited about the opportunity to do something that she really wants to do 
or when you know that you've made it just a little bit easier for somebody to get exactly what they need, then that's really all you need. That's it. I don't, I think it just, I, I like that feeling of making sure that people can get in the places they need to be and they deserve to be. We're not trying to move anybody. I'm not trying to put anybody somewhere they don't need to be or deserve to be. But that young girl, you know what? Who knows? She could be, you know, the next Yvette Lee Bowser making the next living single for her generation. Right. You know, uh, so we'll see. Well, and I think it's so important um, that we have more Mia Jacksons um, because I think so often, unfortunately, we don't help one another out because it feels like there's a zero sum game. It's either you or me and it can't be we. Right. And, and you start you're starting to see people that that they're they're getting opportunities and they're bringing somebody with them. Um, but but I think it's a gift that you have, Mia. Like, right. And I hope people can learn from like folks like Mia, like how important it is to when you don't want to pick up that phone. Like, right. Um, the impact that you have when you do. Yes. And you, yeah, you still have to do it, even if you say, oh, I don't feel like talking you know, today. But you realize that's part of a responsibility that you have. When you if you consider yourself a part of a community, you owe a little bit. Yeah. I think it's not something that, well, if I have it, what good does it do for me to hoard all of it and keep it to myself? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing good comes of that. That's for sure. Well, and you have a beautiful daughter, Taylor, mm -hmm. right? Who's navigating this space and this journey right now. Um, as a young black woman navigating the new America that we're, yes. we're all living in, right? Um, what is some advice that you have for her and what are the things that you are seeing where she is meeting those obstacles as she's trying to get into the club? It, uh, a lot of the things that I didn't know to do, the agency that I didn't have for myself, I was able to tell her, you need this. Mm. Let me tell you how to do this. Yeah. Or uh, you know, she came out of the gate getting much more than I had. Primarily because she had the experience and she had the benefit of watching me and friends and all these other people. And she knew all these people that I knew when she went to college. I, I tell folks this all the time. When I went to college, I was brand new, had no idea, had never set foot on Stanford's campus until first day of freshman year. We're going around when she's there. and She's like, oh, my God, I used to play over there. Oh, you wow. know, this is familiar to her. This is, a, you know, this is not it was still her own experience and it was different than mine, but she didn't have that. I don't belong here feeling this mm -hmm. was already somewhere she knew. So even when she would go for positions and she's like, mom, they want me to take this position and it's pretty high profile. And I'm like, well, can you do it? Well, yeah, I can do it. Well, let's go for it. See what happens. And when it doesn't work out, I think there are a couple of times in my career when it didn't work out, you just, take your box of things and you go out the door when it's, when it's her turn. I'm like, no, -uh, girl, you go back and you get what you're supposed to get when you go out the door. Yeah. So it makes a huge difference having the benefit of having someone who's been there, done it and know and knows how to tell you what you deserve in the space. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it's so much easier to, to advise somebody else like, right. than to take that own advice uh, on your own. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I'm hearing from what you're saying, uh, what you're passing on to Taylor is that she has to be her own biggest advocate. Yeah. Like we have to advocate for ourselves because no one else is going to do it the way that we would, right? No one's going to know us better than we do. No one knows what we want um, to get to. And, and people are going to presume you want to get to get here when you actually want to go that way. Mm -hmm. So you have to advocate for yourself. Yeah. And people are quick to tell you what you need, right? Quick yeah. to tell you, oh, well, no, that's not really good for you. Or that. And you have to know right away, wait, no, wait, that is good for me. And this is why. Yeah. And if you're not sure and secure of that, even, you know, even when you are, uh, it will be a little rocky. It'll be a lot more rocky if you're not sure. But if when you have a little bit of agency and you're able to say, you know what, I know exactly what I want from this experience, then makes a difference. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, I saw um, a reflection on social media recently that basically said something to the effect of um, the inner conversation you have with yourself mm -hmm. is the most important one. Yeah. The inner conversation you have with yourself is the most important one. Make mm -hmm. sure it's healthy and positive. So mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, Mia, of a few things. One, how does that land with you? 
Um, what are some of the inner conversations you were having early on in your career or your journey? And what are those conversations like now if they're different? Uh, I think you spoke to something that actually I thought about earlier this week. Uh, and it was the not asking for help piece yeah. and feeling like it was a handout. And so one of the, I said my next message to the kids was going to be, you can always ask for help. It's not a handout. And I think I had to grow to that point to realize, wait a minute, you're not because you're asking for help. Back then, I would think, oh, my gosh, just, I'm, they're going to think I'm stupid. Or, oh, yes. my God, they're going to think I don't know what I'm doing. Or, wow, I should have known this. And you're telling yourself, you're beating yourself up about things that you couldn't have, shouldn't have known at that stage in your career. But you feel like I'm supposed to know everything when I get here. Yeah. And that's not the case. Yeah. So that inner dialogue is key and critical. And if you don't have anyone even sort of helping you set your affirmations or your mantras or whatever it is you need to say to yourself, if you don't have a group of people that help you affirm yourself, it is easy to go down that slippery slope and tell yourself that, you know what, I didn't deserve that anyway, or no, I wasn't good for that anyway, and not realize, wow, I was. Exactly. And so- it's key. It's critical. And I think now, though, I'm able to say, well, you know what? Even Because you're still going to doubt yourself at times. You're still going to have those moments where you're like, "Ooh, you know, what am I getting into? Should I really do this? And then you have to say yourself, I mean, I think I wrote it out. I have it right here. Do big things. Mm. You know, you can do big things and you have to remind yourself of that. Even if you've done it before, you still have to remind yourself of it. Yeah. Do big things. I love that. And, and, Thank you for naming one of the reasons why many of us um, black women um, don't ask for help because it is, it's, it's the, the Olympics that we're playing in our mind of if I ask for help, they're going to think that I think that, that, right. It goes back and forth that they don't think that I'm smart enough, that I'm capable, yes. that I can do this. And I am not going to give them like the liberty mm -hmm. of thinking that way. And the truth of the matter is like, like if you need to get a, an outcome, if asking for help is going to help you get to that outcome sooner, like they may think that way about you anyway. Yeah, exactly. But it's not going to look at it. And give you the key to, <laughs> right, um, to deliver. So, but it is, it's one of those things that gets in this way. And, and, and as an athlete, right, that was one of the things I don't want people to think they already label us as dumb athletes. So why am I going to give them an extra, right, um, flame for the fire? Exactly. Exactly. And so, as you said, the folks who think that are going to think that regardless of whether you came in and got an A on the test yeah. or, you know, did everything you needed to do or you came in and failed, they're going to think the same exact thing about you. It will not matter whether you ask, you know what, why don't you give me that number right over there, please, real quick. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to change anything for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it feels like um, you've always been a disruptor. Right. And and. Um, it, it came out when we all got together, you, Beverly, and I got together to do the podcast Game Changers Live. Um, and it was this sense of both you and I in particular, Bev, to a certain degree, were consumed with sports talk radio and, right, and we just saw the world through a different prism than was being represented in all of those conversations. Mm -hmm. And we felt, felt we could do it differently. We can actually have these deep conversations about important topics in sports, not just the final score. Um, what was it that you were hoping to unlock through Game Changers Live and how does that live on in your life? I think we did unlock quite a bit mm. um, because we did have those conversations. We talked about them from our lens when, as you said, we listened to a lot of sports talk radio and you're talking back to the car radio as you're driving saying, what the heck did you, you know, <laughs> realizing they're not paying attention to a lot of the undercurrent. Uh, that's happening in a lot of these athletes' lives. And I think we were able to say, Let, let's get to the core of some of these things. Let's talk about it in a way that maybe someone isn't talking about it. Yeah. I remember when we had, I think it was Doris Burke. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, and you brought her on. And it was an incredible conversation. Even her, you know, telling us things that she had to go through and saying, well, you know what? Somebody, I, she, things that she was, you know, the dialogue she was having with herself and why she wasn't moving forward, the things that she, the help she had to get from colleagues. Um, so I don't know if 
your general sports talk show would really care about that. And I know that there were other women out there who listened to us who actually did. And so I think we did a lot of that and there was a gap and we filled it. Yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. We had some amazing guests in those conversations and um, it was just fun being able to be in conversation on a regular basis with folks that like, again, that love sports at that level. I think our last one was um, when Andrew Luck retired. Yes. And uh, we were all sad. I'm still sad mm-hmm. that uh, Andrew retired, but uh, that was a lot of fun. And, and hoping to recreate some of those conversations um, here through Unlocking the Club. Um, mm-hmm. We'll cover sports and a lot of different landscapes. Um, but one of the things that you actually did in sports and beyond is community building. Like, right. I remember the first time I met you was with Sideline Pass mm-hmm. um, as you, you came to my office with the Washington Mystics to do an interview. Um, but you've done so many things in building community, whether it's the NFL mo- moms of NFL players, et cetera. What is it in, that's important to you about community building projects? I think I like putting people together who can actually grow or build something together or even if just be supported um and if it's around a certain topic all the better we have and i've done it i keep telling myself every time this is the last time i'm gonna do this this is the last time i'm gonna do this yeah yeah then somebody says mia can you you need to do another mastermind group with them like uh you know and then you do it and then you realize, wow, people are saying this is actually changing something for them. And that makes a big difference because it's like, okay, yeah, it was an eight to 10 week project was supposed to be eight to 10 weeks. Now it has actually turned into 12 weeks because these people don't want to let it go because it is helping them so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even during the pandemic, we did a happy hour and it seems like a small thing, but it ended up being such a relief and a release for so many people. And we would get to the point where, you know, we had a bartender who would curate these boxes for us and we would record her because she's taking us through and teaching us all these things. And at some point though, the conversation would start going and I'm like, okay, now is when we turn off the recording so y'all can get out. <laughs> right, <laughs> we right. turn off the recording and some of those conversations were, I swear, epic, epic. Mm-hmm. But I mean, they and they spanned everything from career, people trying to make career moves, people in families, what happens, divorce, you name it. Yeah. But there were, and a lot of the people were either, even if they were married, some of them weren't necessarily connected, but we also had people who were single who couldn't get out and see all of their friends or couldn't get out to just connect with people. And not everyone drank. We had people who were like, I'm not here for the drinks. I'm here for the conversation. Conversation, yeah. And so I realized it was feeding people's souls to be able to have that and have a space where they could be the authentic self that we talked about before, learn a little something, because that's the other thing we always like learning. Uh, We're nerds at heart Uh, and, and still just, you know, feel good when they leave and feel heard, seen and appreciated and respected mm-hmm. at, while having fun all together at once. And that's hard to do. That is hard to do. That is hard to do. And I wonder if the last two years in COVID actually amplified the necessity for something like that. Oh, yes, definitely. I don't think that wouldn't have happened. And we also did a group called Reset and it was just a group of women. Uh, and we would meet on Saturday mornings and... <laughs> It was like, I don't know, people, <laughs> one friend's like, I think it was a spiritual experience for me it, because everyone realized how much they needed it, how much they actually, their soul, their, their person, their self needed that yeah. to be heard in that way and to have a reliable group of people who were there for you. Right. So it was, I don't know if it would have been as strong a connection had it not been for the lack that people felt from COVID. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. Well, and, and I think like for Doral Marketing and Sideline Pass, like how do you kind of grow and maintain these groups that you create? Because like how you're doing it is very different than others would prioritize. 
And, and that's something I'm still grappling with. That's an area of learning because mm-hmm. people will say to me, why aren't you monetizing this? Mm-hmm. And that gets back to, well, maybe I should be monetizing some of it, but how do I do it and still maintain the integrity of it? That's a hard one for me. Um, you know, we'll see if there's a way to do it. Cause a lot of the things that I did with sideline pass was, was great, but the when when the money part was there, it changes things. Yeah. It shifts yeah. things. Yeah. And um so it's it's still about that's still something that's a little tricky that I'm trying to figure out how to do. Yeah. Well it's interesting. And we're gonna have to save this for another episode because I wonder how much of the club, like this is how we're supposed to be doing things because this is how I need to be seen. Mm-hmm. Like the essence of being this community builder, this relationship person, and to monetize it does that shift what people, how people see me? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much that is, right? Standing in the way of you unlocking your Mm -hmm. financial potential and your wealth. Because you are really good at this and people actually benefit from it. And I'm sure it does. I'm sure it's standing in the way of something. And I have to figure out exactly how to walk that balance, walk that tightrope. Yeah. What what are you afraid of in that situation? Like what, what are you afraid of giving up or losing? I I think I would hate to lose just the organic relationships yeah. that develop because people are there because they want to be, not because they paid, not because they're expecting, you know, this for their $499 or whatever. Um, but, you know, they get up on a Saturday morning, you know, people on the West Coast are getting up and like, I'll be there at seven and and yeah. and making sure that they're they're there because they want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the part that I don't want to lose. Yeah. No, it's an important piece, right? And I think for you, some of the ROI, in fact, is those relationships and is knowing that people are getting up at 7 a.m. Pacific time to be part of this. And so it may not be the green currency or the cryptocurrency that's crashing Mm -hmm. right now, um, but it's it's the Mia currency that feeds your soul. Yes, that's it for sure. I mean, because it does. And even when I said, ah, like I said, I don't want to do this. And, you know, y'all, the last day of this was supposed to be March, you know, the first of March. And they're like, uh, we can't let it go, Mia. You have to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. are you are you crazy? Yeah. You know, but uh, and then you keep going. And you keep going. So, you keep going. And, and this conversation could keep going on for hours yeah. and hours. You all see yeah. what like our we'd be preparing for a show. And we'd have a side conversation that would end up being an hour. Like we wish we would hit record on these mm-hmm. conversations. But it has been a, a joy and a pleasure having you in this space, Mia. I'm really excited. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Mia Jackson is going to be joining me from time to time on Unlocking the Club to have conversations. Um, we're going to recap some of the the um, interviews that that have taken place. We're going to talk about some current events. We're going to talk a lot about sports and what's going on in the sports world. Um, and we're just going to have a lot of fun. And so I'm looking forward to those moments. I have missed, right, the regular cadence of being in conversation with you on Game Changers Live. And so I thank you for for being willing to, to join me on the screen and having these conversations um, as we move forward. And I don't want to let you go just yet. Like okay. if you're willing uh, we want to do a little bit of something that we call the back nine. Okay. Uh, so we want to round the, the corner. We just hit the clubhouse, grab some drinks, and now we want to play the back nine. We're going to do some rapid fire questions if you're up to it. All righty. Especially on the day that the big golf is happening. Okay. Right, right. We have a lot mm-hmm. going on on the scene. All right. So we'll be right back with, with the, the back nine. All right, Mia. So first question, uh, I know you are a voracious reader, right? Um, you consume a lot of information. You're, you're constantly on the learning journey. Aside from the Unlocking the Club podcast, what are some of your favorite podcasts? Ooh, uh, I have a couple that I listen to. Uh, Death, Sex, and Money. Okay. Love that. Anna Sale. She's a Stanford girl, too, and I didn't even realize it until I'd watched, listened to it. Uh, uh, that's a, one that I really like. Selected Shorts. That's okay. the English nerd in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like that because they have trained actors and actresses reading these incredible 
stories from and everything from new authors to an old an old book you know so it's amazing and that's my that's my nighttime go to uh then there are some sports ones of course uh and then the one with Roxane Gay and Tressie McMillan I'm trying to remember that they have one together okay. that I yeah and that you, you can imagine how crazy that will get okay uh so those are great. And let's see, I'm a podcast. Right. And you have a plethora. So we're going to have to right, yeah. follow Mia at Slide Mind Pass on Twitter and Instagram and find out uh, some of her, her favorite podcasts because I know that it's an extensive list. Um, so along that same vein, let's say that you um, are any city of your choice uh, and you have a, a table for five, uh, including you. Um, living or deceased, who are four people that you invite to to be at dinner with you in that restaurant? Who? Okay, living or deceased, and it could be anybody. Anybody, anybody you okay. want. So Tony Morrison and Octavia Butler first. Okay. They're gonna be there, and they got the seats of honor. Uh, and then my grandmother, I'm bringing her back. Nice. I need to talk to my granny. Uh, so that's three, right? Yep. Let's see, who else do I want there? I have to think real quick on the two. Oh, you just got one more, because one is you. You're, oh, one is me. Yeah. Um, huh. I got to think on that one. I got to think, because there's so many people that are popping in my head. Yeah. But I'm like, because I think it would be Harriet Tubman. I want to know what girlfriend did. But to, to go back. Over yes, and and over yeah. and over. But yeah. also to elude, and I mean, just... Yeah. I want to know how you had the, yeah. when we talk about having confidence. Yes. Yes. Conviction. Mm -hmm. and courage. Yeah. And know how. Yeah. Yeah. And she right. had to know the plants and know the stars. And I mean, just think about how brilliant she had to be. People yeah. talk about her fortitude, but the brilliance. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, for yeah. sure. Well, I'm going to, you have to let me know what restaurant and what time, because I'm going to try to get this table next to you so I can eavesdrop in on that conversation. <laughs> Come on, girl. Be quite Come on. For sure. Well, uh, what is on your bucket list? Like one thing that's on your bucket list right now. On my bucket list, uh, got to write a book. Okay. It's a title. Write a book. Huh? But do you have a title? Uh, I do I have a working title, but okay, okay. You, you won't know. reveal it just yet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But I do. I love it. All right, I cannot wait mm -hmm. uh, for that. We'll we'll have you on the show and, and interview for that. Well, I, I'll tell you the title. Uh, it's when company comes. Mm. That's so much there. There's yeah. So much. So, so, so there's a poem. There's a line in the poem, uh, and it talks about, and it says, "They send me to the back when company comes," and yeah. so. I always love that line in this poem. Yeah, there's, that, there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, Neil, what have you learned about yourself over the last couple of years um, since we've been in COVID? Whew. I've learned that I don't organize well. Hmm. I don't organize things organize well. Organize things or your life? Things. I can organize parts of my life and anything mentally, but when you start talking about putting things together, my child is always like, nah. <laughs> You know, yeah. uh, she was she's she's the type that can fold and pack and you know, and, and I'm like, just throw it in there at this point. And so I'm realizing how much of myself I need to take some time. I'm learning. That's something I've now put into. I'm on this whole minimalist journey, yeah. trying to figure out how to pare down and get rid of some things because I don't need that. Yes. Uh, and that's been definitely an incredible part of the journey for me, realizing what I really need. For myself and not and I don't mean just physical things, just actually need and why I'm holding on to certain things that I don't need. Yeah. So that's, that's been something I've learned a lot about myself. That's a topic in and of itself, because what I learned from like our parents' generation is like everything that they got and were able to purchase was so meaningful to them. Yes. They were not gonna be wasteful. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And, so and it's hard. Kind of detachment. It's tough to detach from things. When but also, like, if you, you you feel like if I throw it away, because uh, we were talking about this in my mastermind, if you feel like if you're throwing it away, you are being wasteful, right? Yes. So I had to find a way 
I found these buy nothing groups on Facebook and all these other places where I can give some of these things away and not give them away, but still not feel like I'm being wasteful. So today I gave away some of my daughter's old dance shoes. Mm. And this young girl was like, oh my God, these are expensive. I need them so bad. I, I listed them on buy nothing. And she's like, I'll come pick them up. Yeah. No. And so I'm realizing a way to, be, to blend the two. Yeah. Well, the thing to consider in this, again, I shared this with my mom a lot, is, is how do you reframe it? That yes. you're not throwing something away. Mm -hmm. You're giving it to somebody that could use it more than you can in this moment. The giving it away was never an issue. For me to give was not the problem. It was when people were just telling me, toss it. Because yeah. all of these books yeah. tell you, just put it in the trash. Just toss no, it. No, it's giving like, no, I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, what, and I think that this ties into that, like, right? Like, so how do you center yourself? Like, there's so much going on in the world right now. Like, when do you find time and how do you center yourself? Baking does a lot of that for me. Mm. That's my time to just sort of be with me, think, and, you know, you, you've got this outcome still. I give it. I, I give the stuff away because I can't eat it all, but it's just the process of, you know what? I want to make that perfect cookie where I want to make these croissants and it's a three day process and, you know, and, and just taking the time and, and you're thinking while you're doing it. I can actually think and go through things in my head by myself mm. while it's happening. So that's something that I, that helps me a lot. I love it. Well, as someone who's been the benefactor of your centering, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, well, uh, where, where can um, people find you? Uh, you can definitely find me on Twitter uh, sometimes at Cylon Pass. I need to get on there better LinkedIn for sure. Okay. And I'm always posting something to read on Facebook. That's for sure. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And what are you working on right now? What's What, what has you excited? I think... I, Figuring out this book thing right now has me pretty excited. Okay. Trying to decide how to, a friend challenged me to finish it by the end of the year. And I'm trying to see if I can actually do that. Mm. What would get in the way of you actually doing it by the end of the year? Uh, I'm a big procrastinator. And sometimes, and I don't know how much of that is just fear and how much of that is, oh, you know, you're letting other things happen. Or, or life happens too. Yeah. It's not always just procrastination. Sometimes life is just happening. Yeah. Uh, but I need to sit down and, and and overcome that. Is this really good enough? Can I really write this? Yes, that's so. it right there. That's it. Mm -hmm. Because right, oftentimes the procrastination for a perfectionist, yeah, yes. right, um, is going to be paralyzing. Right? It is. Because you want it to be as good as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. And to, to get, get ready to start, start is... Um, Sometimes we get in our own way. Yes. And so I hope um, for the benefit of all of our listeners and viewers um, that you find the space and the time to be able to dig in and to tell your story and to um, for us to be on the lookout for when company comes. Because mm -hmm. I have no doubt that it's going to be a, a revealing and insightful um, read for, for anybody that gets the, the pleasure to, to be able to read it. All righty. Thank awesome. you. Well, thank you, Mia, for, for joining us on Behind the Scenes with Unlocking the Club. Um, as I said, like I am over the moon that uh, you'll be joining uh, us from time to time for these episodes. Looking forward to more conversations. As you all can see, we can talk on and on and on okay. and on. And I'm sure <laughs> after this conversation, we're going to hit stop on, on the button and we're going to continue the discourse um, after this show. But uh, again, I want to thank Mia Jackson for joining us today on Behind the Scenes with Unlocking the Club. I want to thank you all for listening in, uh, whether it's on YouTube or on Spotify or iTunes. Um, we look forward to continuing to have these conversations with you in the future. Yes. Well, From thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Mia. It's good having you here as well. I'm Angela Taylor, host for Unlocking the Club. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social, where you'll be the first to know the latest news on our lineup of guests, as well as more interviews and insights between episodes. 
Until next time, let's unlock the club. <laughs>